Hawa. All praise our creator. Because this is not a distraction for us. Nah, I'm not. For us, this is proving Hawa. When we prove our rainbow, right? When we show how the rainbow can only be arching because of, of a reflection within a round enclosure or firmament. We're going to talk some more about the firmament. <laughs> um, right now, I mean, my night. It's reflecting off of something. It's not just an accidental big bang. You were no accident. You are created in code, in law. The creator's law is the only law, and all these splinter cells going to have to give it up when the code keepers are glorified by Hawa. We don't need no other doctrine. We don't need no other spirituality, no other power, no sacrifices. We were the sacrifice. Halawa. You know, it's um it's it's just a cold thing. Proving Hawa, knowing that we are in an enclosure and in an in firmament, you can't say nothing but there is a creator, which is the name Hawa to exist. <gasps> wow, to be securely, you know, given air, given breath, given revelation, having a secure breath, having a breath of security is your ha and your wa. We're proving the creator by proving the firmer man. We're proving the creator by proving worlds beyond the poles. And it's not hard to do. Admiral Byrd is talking about it. <laughs> We've seen these maps all cooperating, no matter if they look uh, outlandish. I mean, you trust your maps over maps that you ind independently find doing independent recon? You trust good old... Good old, <laughs> about to say good old preacher, man, but we got one preacher, man, that's been popping off on this flat drop. <laughs> I might have to get some more of that preacher, man, man. Yeah, yeah that preacher, man, was preaching some drop, man. <laughs> He's breaking it down, man, in a nice comprehensive study. So we've been talking Van Allen belts, man. We've been talking uh, rockets in a vacuum. You know, we talked some stuff. We done talked Operation High Jump, Operation Fishbowl. Worlds beyond the poles. Let's go. I mean, we are proving the creator. A firm, fixed, and move immovable stationary earth is what was breaking down in First Chronicles 16. Fixed, immovable. How did we let them put us on a planet? It's all NASA's doing, right? NASA and planets are synonymous, man. NASA and planets are synonymous, man. Greek plazine to make devious, man. Yeah, NASA and planets are synonymous, man. Repel from what? That means you're trying to get somewhere, you're trying to see clearly, and you are repelled from getting to your checkpoint because of a illusion. Dissuaded from the right path, my nigga. This is a planet. This is what NASA's talking about. The wandering stars to wonder. Yeah. Well, let's just talk about the root, right? The root. Pele means flat or to spread, to spread out, man. Flat, man. <laughs> plain, yes. Plain. How do you turn plain into planet? 
Oh, NASA, you are devious, repelling us from seeing clearly, dissuading us from our right path. So called, because it ain't true, because they have apparent motion. It's apparent because it ain't it ain't true. Uh, apparently it might have motion. So called. Man, I try to tell you. Hawa said all this is within the firmament. That crystal layer that the hijack can't get through. That throne. Isaiah 40. A while walking to and fro. He that sits above the circle of the earth. I mean, had it not been told you from the beginning, my night? Have you not understood the foundations of the earth? It is he, Hawa, that sits above the circle. But that circle is from the Hebrew word kawug. 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 I mean, you got all these links, Managa, you know. This is a brand new flat drop series, man. We just calling it Flat Drop 101. And I just popping off because I got to pop off, man. You know what I'm saying? You know when you just got to be popping off. It's all happening. You know, this is great conversation. I need my noggins to be oriented because we can't do much with you when you're still spinning, spinning on a ball. You're not focused. You don't know why, but you subconsciously think you're spinning at 1,100 miles per hour. That's an issue for us because <laughs> we're firm, fixed, and immovable. We're standing still. You know what I'm saying? We are planted, firm, fixed, and movable. We're just talking the Circle of the earth, which is not a ball. <laughs> it's a circle, man. You can draw a circle on a flat plane, can't you? Take a piece of paper and draw a circle. Bang. Got it. Circle. <laughs> or the circle could be re referring to something called Kawug. And this Kawug connects us to an element of roundness. See where he's breaking down this cool pull of this link is called the Flat Earth Bible. Man. So he's using a lot of script, breaking down a lot of Hebrew roots, you know, doing a little compare and contrast. There we go. Kawug. All right. So other passages complete the picture of the sky as a lofty physical dome. A wa sits throned on the vaulted roof of the earth. We just read <laughs> the circle of the earth. <clears throat> you know, <laughs> translations, translations. Others say vaulted roof. Wow. I wonder why they changed it to circle. Because then in your mind, you could see a ball. But a circle is not a ball. Amen. Circle is not a ball. Vaulted roof of the earth. Kawug. C-H-U-W-G. Whose inhabitants are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the sky. Shabayim like a curtain. Manage. Where do you get a ball? He spreads them out like a tent. Manage. Just Google a picture of the tent. Now you're getting a lot warmer as to the orientation of things when there is a certified dome above you that they're not shooting through. Their rockets are only working in low Earth orbit, man. <laughs> they're just getting across the plane. They're not leaving a ball. They're not popping out that ball that's traveling 67,000 miles per hour, spinning at 1,100 miles per hour into a vacuum, man. The rockets don't work in a vacuum. There's nothing to push off. There's no pressure. <laughs> Stop it, man. Stop the cap. Man. 
Man, in all the years of Cappadocia, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Circle. Kaug. So. Circle. See if there's a uh, uh let's try this lexicon out. Sir <laughs> Hey, say it with me, man. <clears throat> Body bag for the illusion. You know, because we, I always got to give Ahab to the melanated true earth plane on Facebook. I hope they still popping off because, I mean, back in 2016, man, this is what it was all about, man. Foundational recon, foundational documents that have withstood the test of time, that have not been debunked or, or disproven in no capacity other than them hoping they go away. But we get this a lot to rebuttal. Oh, look, it says circle. <laughs> it's a ball, boss. Man, without Ama, they're just speaking vanity, man. And they really are bearing false witness on Hawaii's work. The earth is this great, beautiful earth. Um, to agree with our uh, oppressors. You know, their NASA and their government um, to agree with these hijacks on the orientation of something as important as your world and see it through their eye and let them use your observation to collapse the wave pattern and create a reality against you. That's all you're doing. You think they're going to tell you the truth about your orientation you at war man when does that when do you go to the other army and give them your maps <laughs> when you're at war man i need you to really contemplate this for the body bag of the day man <laughs> circle according to the nasb lexicon is kaug all right same as we just getting about the flat earth Bible. <laughs> Strong's concordance number 2329. Then you got vault. So the vaulted roof is the Kaug, is the circle that's being translated. Or horizon. Why not just say horizon? Because they got to put circle in your head, bone in your mind, bone. Is Kaug. Kaug, Kaug. We're talking Hebrew now. Yeah, man. Pre hijack. To draw around, make a circle. <laughs> Anything about a spinning ball around here? Or we're just talking roundness? Wow, okay. Have drawn a circle, a bound, horizontal line, or horizon line. Uh, compass. Like, yeah, to compass, you know. Oh, okay. Kagak. All right, my nuggets. We seeing clearly. Kug. Isaiah 40, 22. Translated to circle. This is foundational work, man, from the Melanated True Earth play back in 2016. And so is this NASA document, which is withstood the test of time, the trial, uh, the, the burning fires. It still holds its weight, man. This is an official NASA reference publication, 1207, August 1288. But first, I just need you to understand on this circle talk. Back to the flat earth Bible. Where it, where'd it go? Here we go. And shout out to uh, 
Oh, man. This copy doesn't have my man's uh, credentials on it, but I find the other one that has all the drop on it, man. But yeah, shout out to the researcher behind this who's telling you over and over again. First Chronicles 1630, he has fixed the earth firm. Psalms 93 1, thou has fixed the earth immovable and firm. Psalm 96 10, he has fixed the earth firm, immovable. Psalm 105 4 and 5, thou didst fix the earth on its foundation so that it never can be shaken. That's as clear as you're going to get it. Isaiah 45 18, who made the earth and fashioned it and himself fixed it fast which means it ain't moving. Job 9 and 8, who by himself spread out the heaven, Shamayim. Spread it out like a tent, right? <laughs> the heaven, Shamayim, tell out the glory of Hawa, the vault of heaven, Rakia, reveals his handiwork. The vault of heaven is the firmament, my naga. Handiwork reveals that something's being done. <laughs> Some work's being put in. There's an actual structure being built. A while's proud of this. And you bear false witness, taking the glory away from the creator. We're returning the glory to Hawa. We're proving his work. We're proving Hawa's existence. We're proving Ahmad's existence. We're not going to let you go into some accidental space dust fart called the Big Bang. We're not going to let you get pooted out of here, man. We talking the gas, man. Rockets in a vacuum, man. <laughs> Kaug literally means circle, right? Kaug. Kaug. Circle. Kaug. Ka. Okay. By extension, it can mean roundness, as in a rounded dome or vault. This is very important, this firmament round dome situation, because it establishes Hawa's handiwork, right? It reveals his handiwork. And the Papu Vu, again, he's called the God of the Sky. <clears throat> Translated God of the sky and Amaz called the God of the earth, right? And then you get Mother Earth and, you know, uh, our earthly mother talk, right? So, Ping Pao, God of the sky, you know, he's spreading it out, man. He's, he's hammering it in, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> he's actually putting in that sky work. Mama's putting on that, putting in that earth work. They're working together. She's the first of his creations, Proverbs 8. So according to that, just even by that logic, he needed her. He needed Ama before he popped off anything. He had to get that house in order. Their children are you <laughs> in order. Before anything could be handled, Mama had to be there. Nothing was created without her. We're putting it back together. We're putting our puzzle back that they took out and bastardized, man. So if this kaug literally means circle, man, or encompass, like the rounded dome. Job 22, 14 says, Hawa sits, walks to and fro on the vault of heaven. <laughs> Come. can you see clearly you think they can get to the throne you think they can get into your flow unless they invite it they nuking it operation fishbowl throwing nukes in the sky acting like they want to test uh See how they could penetrate the Van Allen belt or something, they say. Crazy. 
which only means they're trying to get past it. They're trying to find a way through something, whether they call it the Van Allen belt outside their ball or it's the actual rounded dome or the vault of heaven. They're trying to blast a hole through. They realize they're trapped balls. <laughs> you know, people like to say, oh, you know, that means that we're in a prison planet and da -da. To, to them it's prison. No, the hijack is trapped. To, to you, this is home. All of Nagaville is yours outside of all these boundaries. But this is a, you know, a practice field, so to speak. <laughs> this is where we practice and, and, and tune up, you know what I'm saying? And get, we already know the flow beyond the wall. You know, we, we, we know the flow of the throne. You know, we're coming direct in that hawa, direct in that breath. You know it, it's already in you, but this is a practice ground for you to tune up. How to keep the cold, man. Meditate on the cold. Continue to go. Continue to 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 fight through it, man. This is a battlefield. But you all all you're doing is practicing for your perfection. You know what I mean? Don't be so hard on yourself about being perfect. You know what I mean? But you're practicing every day. You're learning something. You're downloading some information every day that can go back into the mainframe. Hawa. So you're very useful. You know, we're all like uh, dreadlocks, you know, going to the same head. You know, we're not separated. We just appear to be separated. We come from a oneness of things. It's a practice ground to observe ourselves. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? To observe, you know, um, ourselves in all these situations. And see how we can put together a common observation. One that is guaranteed to work. When that's keeping the code not work. I'll wait. I see what not keeping the code does. But, I, you know, the evidence of keeping the code. You know you were the head, right? You didn't have to borrow from them. Man, it's flat drop 101, man. All this is related to your awareness. To have the code in you, to have your frequency tuned up, to be in your 432, to spiral up, to know your indigenous truth, which is what we're talking about, your ancient love song, India Superior, and to know that you're not spinning on no damn ball, that there's orientation. You know, we got masks with Preston John outside the wall. <laughs> the enemy would not want their enemy to know the existence of all the the land, the earth. You know what I mean? <clears throat> Get my tea, man. God. If they see you as an op, they're not going to want, want you to know your orientation. You know what I'm saying? Where all the land is and the vortexes and, you know, all the secrets. Come on. Let's just come, you know. So don't go to them as no evidence. You can't go to NASA for evidence. NASA ain't never been for the people, man. You got to be for the people. You got to, you know, find the repeatable, observable you know, situations, you know what I'm saying, so that we can have real science. Repetition and observation is real science. The rainbow proving the reflection off this vault of heaven is real science. Study refraction. <laughs> Go get that last drop, part two. This is part three. The Baffert level experiment, which we'll talk about, you know, in a later drop, they're measuring six miles apart on this lake. And if you're on a ball, I don't, you, there ain't, there ain't no flat water on a ball. You're on a ball. Your ball should be curving. Your water should be curving. Your land should be curving. Everything curving. You're on a ball. You can't not be on a ball conveniently because you don't want to do the math. You can't build a 700 mile long bridge and not a, not account for the curvature of the earth. 
when every single mile you should have at least six inches of curvature. So do the calculation for 700 miles. Six inches times 700 is your curvature. Did they equate for the curvature when they Aztec are building a railroad? <laughs> a thousand mile, hundred mile railroads, do they equate for how much curvature of the earth every six, you know, six inches every mile? That 700 mile long bridge in China, <laughs> 700 miles, did they equate at all? The engineers equate one day for curvature? When that bridge better be curving on that ball. 700 miles, Jack. Every mile, six inches, Jack. It adds up to feet and it adds up, you know what I mean, to, to miles. If you go far enough, and where's the curvature? It wasn't measured in the Bedford level experiment. They, they kept finding no matter if they went down, you know, six miles, they're reading the same levels on top of the water. That <laughs> One isn't six inches lower. It's all level for miles. It's level water on a ball, a spinning ball. So I'm just talking on your man. We just having a conversation. You know, if you've been fighting this this vibration you know you you want to be on a spinning ball you you believe in you know everything the teacher taught you it just makes sense you you're really in the space and like i used to be man you know but i still am that's that that's what makes me so good at this you know i'm really into this man I'm really into it man like the bro and i said this was at the forefront of our pop offness you know what i'm saying um you know, the code obviously, you know, is going to be the meeting point for all the, the drop. It got to come back to the code. It got to come back to the source. It's got to be for a purpose. You know, we're proving Hawaii. So we most die over everything. You know, this is uh validating rule number one in the code. No power above our power. They can't give you no accidental big bang to take the power away from the creator no more we got to prove the creator m-h-o-e kaug implies a physical object and they're using it in the script man they're using it in the script right from the script man and it's just uh, also interesting when I look at the heavens being translated with uh, Shamayim. As he was saying in the uh, Flat Earth Bible. And I see that Mayim, you know, I think about the Mai, you know what I mean? I see the Shah, I think about the She, Shashia. <laughs> also known as the all Mac. Yeah, man. You know, it's just interesting, right? You see the Sha or the She, you see the Mayim or the Mai. People of the heavens, huh? Sky knockers, huh? Okay. Earth also harets, which reminds me of Hertz. <laughs> what frequency is the earth? What frequency you on? 432 Hertz. Hertz. Uh oh. Correlations from a dragonfly perspective. Coog, vault, horizon. All right, we're just doing some Hebrew study. Let's go, Kaug. <laughs> Kaug implies a physical object. So when they're giving us plain as day in a script, he sits enthroned above the circle of the earth and his people are like grasshoppers. He stretches out the heavens like a canopy or a tent and spreads them out <laughs> like a tent to live in, man. That doesn't imply no ball, no, no spinning ball. Okay. 
for that to be for that symbol to be put on it is a false idol. That globe, that ball that people worship is idolatry again. Right now we're pushing the line for rule number one and our commandment flow and our code, you know what I'm saying? Our nine code. No false idols. Most high over everything. This ball is an idol. It's a Baal. We got to get you off this thing, man. It's flat drop 101. Earth. How in the world are you going to ever find a picture of the earth, man? If they never give you a real picture of the earth, if they still can't put one satellite out there and turn its ass around and allow it to give us a live feed of the earth spinning, it should be called as the world turns, as the earth spins. We should be able to plug into it on the internet at any time and see the goddamn earth spinning at 1,100 miles per hour. And don't make it look super slow because it's a super big earth. 1,100 miles per hour is 1,100 mother sucking miles per hour. I want to see some spinning, boss. Earth. Herets. What what herets is this? What hertz is this? This is 440 hertz. This is distracting and disorienting. Bullcrap. All these are composites. Not one of these are real pictures, man. And you want to tell me you know where you live in and this is what they're giving you. This is what they're giving you, man. This ain't a real picture, man. If you think this is real, man, then go ahead and, you know, build yourself a diamond castle, man. Go crazy, man. <laughs> man, go. go. <laughs> you might as well just enjoy life, man. They put the damn globe in our classroom and they inceptioned us and planted an idea a symbol and we can't get it out of our brains I'll stop when you see a real picture why all the capri why not an actual picture of earth I mean, we all would love to see a real picture. We we really love to see it, right? But I can go on and on, man. And you're not going to find one. Not one, man. In 2022, there should be millions of pictures of the Earth, man. NASA should be taking another 10 billion pictures a day. And you're telling me this is all we get? I need you to think about that, my night. I mean, this monogas is having a hard time letting this go. Yeah, you think it's like this, huh? <laughs> All right, so. Earth. <laughs> You're going to have to see it clearly to even crack the you know, break through they spell. You're going to have to stop spinning. You're going to have to see it clearly. With circle, we're talking an enclosure. Something encompassing. Like a vault, you know. Of the earth. Well, now you just got a firm, fixed, and immovable plane. So you have this roundness or rounded dome or vault. A wall walks to and fro on the vault of heaven. Ka'u. In both verses, the use of ka'u implies a physical object on which one can sit and walk. Likewise, the context in both cases require elevation. In Isaiah, the elevation causes the people below to look small as grasshoppers. In Job, a wise eyes must penetrate the clouds to view the doings of humans below. Elevation is also 
implied by Job 22 and 12. Surely Hawa is at the zenith of the Shamayim of the heavens. Or the Shemaya. <laughs> and looks down on all the stars high as they are. This picture of the cosmos is reinforced in Ezekiel's vision, the Hebrew word rakia, rakia, appears five times in Ezekiel, four times Ezekiel 1, 22 through 26, and once in Ezekiel 10, verse 1. Okay, so in each case, the context requires a literal vault or dome. When you talk in Rakia, you're talking a literal vault or dome. And it's been, what, four times, appearing five times in Ezekiel, four times Ezekiel um, 1, 22 through 26, and once in Ezekiel 10, verse 1. So the vault appears above the living creatures and glitters like a sheet of ice. Uh-oh. <laughs> above the vault is a throne of sapphire or lapis lazuli. Yeah, I mean, that part's interesting right there. That got me thinking about that sapphire stick, man, the staff of Moshe, the staff of the Prester. I remember that in the book of Jashir. All right, so if the vault, the vault, above the vault is a throne of sapphire. I mean, is there any energetic connection <laughs> With this stick, I mean, uh, the book of Jashar, Jashir, Jashar, uh, chapter 77, just hit a verse uh, 38. Oh, right, let's go to 37. And Reuel commanded Moses to be brought out the dungeon. Remember, he was put in the dungeon for 10 years. His queen kept him alive, all right? She said, no one is checking on the Hebrew man. He said, man, he's probably dead. She said, but if he's alive, will you let him out? They checked on him. He was alive. He said, man, that's a miracle of Hawa. Right, well, let him out the dungeon after 10 years. Then he gets out to save Israel. <laughs> He's in his 70s by this time, man. All right, so. Right, well, commanded Moshe to be brought out the dungeon. So they shaved him and he changed his prison garments and ate bread. And afterward, Moshe went into the garden of Reuel, which is was behind the house. And here he prayed to Hawa, his power, who had done mighty wonders for him. And it was that while he prayed, he looked opposite to him and behold, a sapphire stick. Yeah, you know, the book of Yashar gives us a little more clarity on Moses' staff. <laughs> When we dig on Preston John, this comes up a lot, this sapphire staff, and some call it the emerald staff. I mean, hey, either way, you talk about the frequency connected above the vault, you know, the throne. So the sapphire staff was placed in the ground, which was planted in the midst of the garden, and he approached the stick, and he took, or and he looked, and behold, the name of Hawa of hosts was engraved thereon, written and developed upon the stick. So what does this sapphire stick, <laughs> this sapphire staff, have to do with the vault of heaven, the throne of Hawa, of sapphire, or lapis lazuli? Seated on the throne is a form in human likeness, which is radiant and like the appearance of the glory of Hawa. In short, Ezekiel saw a vision of Hawa sitting throned on the vault of heaven, as described in Isaiah 40, 22. I mean, that's just a pretty amazing connection with this sapphire staff. And I'll leave the link so you can see how important this staff was and you know, how Moshe was able to pull it out when all of the Kenites couldn't do it. It was like a Excalibur situation. They all tried to pull this staff that was planted in Reuel or Jethro's garden. No one could pull it out, but 
Moshe did very easily, just like Excalibur, right? <laughs> just like King Arthur. So see a lot of parallels with his sapphire staff being planted, grounded <laughs> in the garden of Red Well. And it has Hawa's name on it, right? And he read it and stretched forth his hand and plucked it like a forest tree from the thicket and the stick was in his hand. Atacom was... 20 years old when he reigned over Egypt. He reigned four years in the 206th year of Israel's going down to Egypt did Adikam reign over Egypt, but he continued not so long in his reign over Egypt as his fathers had continued their reign. For Milo, his father reigned 94 years in Egypt, but he was 10 years sick and died for he had been wicked before Hawaii and all the Egyptians called the name of Adikam Pharaoh like the name of his fathers as was their custom to do in Egypt all the wise men of Pharaoh called the name Adikam Ahuz for short is called Ahuz in the Egyptian Egyptian language and Adikam was exceedingly ugly <laughs> and he was a Cuban in a span and he would so he was real short and he had a great beard, which reached the soles of his feet. I thought the Egyptians didn't have no beards, man. That's crazy, huh? <laughs> the Pharaoh had a huge beard. <laughs> and Pharaoh sat upon his father's throne to reign over Egypt. So, you know, we're just getting some backstory as to what was popping off before he got this stick. Okay, so he exceeded his father. Verse 8, and while he reigned, he exceeded his father and all the preceding kings in wickedness. And he increased his yoke over the children of Israel. All right, so it was all bad. It was all bad. Moses was put in the dungeon. <laughs> And Moses, the son of Amram, was still confined in a dungeon in those days. And Moses was confined in the dungeon of the house of Rehuel for 10 years. Okay. Let's... Then he gets out. He gets this stick <laughs> while he's praying. There he prayed. Moshe went into the garden of Rehuel. There he prayed to Hawa. All the mighty wonders of why I done. You know, he's a free noggin now. He's popping off. He's out the dungeon. And while he prayed, he looked in opposite to him. We got a sapphire stick, a sapphire staff. Okay. And we're just correlating that to the sapphire throne. You know, uh, flat drop 101, you know, we're, Thinking deeply about this. The power that's in this staff, how does it connect to the power that's in the throne of Hawa? I mean, man, I mean, can we say that this staff is even made literally from the throne? Throne of Sapphire? Is Moses' sapphire stick from the sapphire throne of Hawa? It's a good question, right? Because this is the same stick <laughs> with which all the works of Hawa were performed. The sapphire staff is the same staff, the same stick with which all the works of Hawa were performed, including when it turned into a dragon, <laughs> you know, in front of the Pharaoh. 
but they said a snake, right? And after he had created heaven and earth and all the host of them, seas, rivers, and all their fish, and when Hawa had driven Adam from the Garden of Eden, he took the stick in his hand and went and tilled the ground from which he was taken. So Adam had the stick. Adam had the sapphire staff, Monaga. This is high technology, possibly from the throne of Hawa, with Hawa's name on it. <laughs> and it it does a it does amazing things. It's high technology, right? So we're just talking high tech right now. High tech Naga is not just wooden sticks right, that they give in the cartoons and the movies. Verse 44, and the stick came down to Noah. And was given to Shem. So Adam had the staff. Sapphire. Noah had the sapphire staff. Shem had the sta sapphire staff. Abraham had the sapphire staff. Isaac had the sapphire staff. Jacob had the sapphire staff. <laughs> okay. Also, when he took down, when he went down to Egypt, he took it into his hand and gave it to Joseph. Joseph got the sapphire staff. <laughs> man, for Jacob had taken it by force from his brother Esau, man, because I'm sure Esau didn't want to give up that sapphire staff. You know, that, uh, you know, according to at least their version of the story, you know, when he sold this blessing, you know, he was giving up that staff, right? You know, these are times when Hawa is doing a course correction, the same thing with Dawi, you know, uh, taking over the reign from Saul. So Jacob has the staff, took it to Joseph. On the death of Joseph, the nobles of Egypt came into the house of Joseph and the stick came to the hand of Reuel, the Midianite. And this is Zipporah's daddy <laughs> and Moses' father-in-law who put him in a dungeon for 10 years. All right, we're just getting the backstory of this possible sapphire connection with the throne or the vault of heaven and the power, the energy that must be connected since it connects to creation itself and the throne of Hawa. The throne of Hawa. I mean, this connects to the throne, man. And he went out of Egypt and he took it in his hand and planted it in the garden. Why do you think that staff had to get planted, grounded, in Ama? And all the mighty men of the Kenites or Medianites, all the mighty men. So the strongest Nagas came over there to pluck it out, just like Excalibur saw. To pluck it out when they endeavored to get Zippor, his daughter, but they were unsuccessful. So if you're a mighty man that can pluck out the sapphire staff, you get the princess support. <laughs> but they were unsuccessful. So that stick remained planted in the garden of Reuel until he came who had a right to it and took it. So how come none of these Kenites or Medianites had the right to it? You think that staff could have went to Jacob if Jacob didn't have a right to it? Think about it. It's a body bag for the illusion. That staff remained at planet. No one can take it if they didn't have a right to it. Not just anybody in the bloodline. Abraham had to give it to Isaac, not Ishmael. Ishmael didn't get to hold this sapphire staff. That's why they migrate. 
This is why they mad, man. <laughs> this is why they mad, son. I'm serious. I mean, look, the Sapphire staff had to specifically go to, you know, someone with the right to it, right? Jacob had the staff, had to take it by force, but it was his right, or else he couldn't hold the staff to begin with. And when he went down to Egypt, he took it into his hand and gave it to Joseph. All right, so on the death of Joseph, it ended up getting planted in the garden of Reuel. The Kenites, the mighty men, were fighting over this thing, trying to pluck it out to get support. So we remained there in the garden until he came who had a right to it. And when Reuel saw the stick in the hand of Moshe, Moshe holding the sapphire staff, high tech, high tech, he knew he had a right to it. He knew he was of Hawa, you know, specifically charged with this function to carry the staff. The 12 tribes of Jacob are popping off in order, not by accident. Jacob didn't just stumble on the staff and then pop off a lineage without Hawa's blessing, without that Baruch. It was rightfully his. It wasn't an accident. The tribe of Judah ain't no accident. The scepter never departing from Judah ain't no accident. Dawi is not an accident. He who came who had a right to it. To hold that scepter, right? <laughs> the stick in the hand of Moshe. The sapphire staff. Okay. Okay. So is this sapphire staff the same as the throne of sapphire? You know, I don't think anyone's ever asked that before. So, Managa, we surfing away in real time, and we investigate. We're just talking about the throne of Hawa. The throne. Throne of Sapphire. I mean, even Daniel's popping off, you know, uh, disregarding the dome, the essential flatness of the earth's surface is required by verses like Daniel 4, verse 10 through 11. And Daniel the king, quote, saw a tree of great height at the center of the earth, not in the middle of the ball, but the center of the earth, the circle or the plane. Now, whether we're talking Earth Pond 1 or all the Earth Ponds, you know, that's another question. We surfing away. Center of the Earth, though. Let's go. Reaching with its top to the sky and visible to the Earth's farthest bounds. Now, how can this be visible? To the farthest bounds of the earth if you're curving, 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 curving on a ball. I'll wait. I'll wait, boss. You got a tree at the center of the earth. Everyone can see from the farthest of the earth's bounds. And where's the earth bound on a ball? Where's the earth bound on a sphere? On this part of the ball, this is up to them. They standing up this way. They standing opposite this way. <laughs> Two people start out on top of your ball. They they have a shovel. They start digging down and they pop out the other end. But now are they digging down or are they digging up? When they come out the earth on the other side of the ball, are they digging down still? Like they started on the top. They were digging down, right? <laughs> and now they're digging up. They had some type of super gravity shift turned around and start. Let's let's start digging up, boss. And then dug up out the ground, or did they come out feet first? You're not on a damn ball, man. The whole earth can see this tree, man. And it can't happen like that on the ball, man. Ka. Reaching with its top, we're talking about this. Great tree. 
with its top to the sky visible to the earth's farthest bounds. If the earth were flat, a sufficiently tall tree would be visible to the earth's farthest bound. But this is impossible on a ball. Con, con. Why don't we get no real pictures? Come on, y'all. It's 2022. We can't get no satellite feed. Not even a real picture. This is what I get when I Google, I Google Earth. I get this shit. NASA says it's composites. What else is NASA saying? NASA reference publication 1207. Derivation and definition of a linear aircraft model. This is conducted by uh, Eugene L. Duke, Robert F. Antonowitz, and Keith D. Crane Beer. And let's just read the intro and let's read the conclusion. You got a lot of, you know, a lot of sciencey uh, chapters for you to dig on. It's about 102 pages. Let's get to the intro, man. I mean, wow. Wow, wow. This report details the, the development of the linear model of a rigid aircraft of constant mass flying over a flat, non-rotating Earth. NASA, talking about an aircraft model. A definition of a linear aircraft model. In the history of Cappadocia, when do they need linear aircraft models for non-rotating Earth over a flat non-rotating Earth? I thought NASA's popping off rockets and space launches and you know but this is their theory they're theorizing i mean they already got jets and stuff that that shouldn't be nothing new these are billion dollar black up black ops bushes for aircraft of a constant mass flying over a flat non-rotating earth this model consists of a state equation and an observation or measurement equation the system the system equations have been broadly formulated to accommodate a wide variety of applications the linear state equation is derived from the non-linear six degree of freedom equations of motion the linear observation equation is derived from a collecting collection of non-linear equations representing state value variables time derivatives of state variables control inputs flight path air data and other parameters the linear model is developed about a normal trajectory that is general normal trajectory over a flat non-rotating earth why even have to say that boss and what does it say for their dismount, for their conclusion, you know, with all their uh, science, uh, mathematical jargon? Concluding remarks. Here we go. This report derives and defines a set of linear linearized meaning that they're going in a line. I mean, what's NASA really doing? What's SpaceX really doing? I think they want to go straight, boss. You keep hearing this word linear. I think they want to go straight, boss. I don't think they really want to go up like that. They're trying to use all this math to derive something that goes straight. Come on, man. All this math to make something go straight, man. They must want to hit warp speed on, on, on these noggins across the plains. They, they must try to get to places real fast with their linear models on a flat, non-rotating earth. 
Yeah, they must want to hit quantum drive. <laughs> Cause that's all they're going to stray, linear. This report derives and defines a set of linearized system matrices for a rigid aircraft of constant mass flying in a stationary atmosphere, not a vacuum of space, boss. This is NASA over a flat, non-rotating Earth. Both generalized and standard linear straight line system equations are derived from non-linear six degrees of freedom equations of motion and large collections of non-linear observation measurement equations. This derivation of a linear model is general and makes no assumptions on either the reference nominal trajectory about which the model is linearized or the symmetry of the vehicle mass and aerodynamic properties. This is from the Ames Research Center, Dryden Flight Research Facility, National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, Edwards, California, January 8th, 19. 87. It is irrefutable. It has stood the test of time. A hop to the melanated true of plane. We've been body back this hijack. NASA's developing stuff to go straight <laughs> on a flat, non rotating earth, man. Right? <laughs> I mean, where did Admiral Byrd go, man? I mean, <laughs> this was a depiction of it. By Mary Evans in the picture library, the legendary land beyond the poles that go get that, you know, go get part two. You know, you got the links below so you can dig on it. You know what I mean? I'm just talking to my nog. It's not that that's trying to get it real quick so they can get a quick understanding. You're not going to have a real grasp unless you get an understanding. I do these drops, you know, I, I know I, they're hours long sometime, right? So, you know. Pause them, man. You know, come back to it. You don't got to get it all right now and rush the information. You know, fall back and collect the vibration. What did Admiral Byrd see? You know, was he flying something like this? Propelling his way straight like NASA. <laughs> Flat, non-rotating Earth. Finding legendary lands beyond the pole. They got a whole castle over here. Like, whatever they found is civilized. They are like they just found some empty land. It looks to me like they found civilization, boss. But that's just a picture of it. <laughs> they got out the wall. Admiral Byrd discovered more land. The size of the United States, right? <laughs> Y'all remember this, man? What's Elon talking about, man?
mentioned a, a 2024 uh, timetable for for a lunar landing. Pay attention. Before I put my clock on again, wake your asses up, man. 2024. Let's listen to how they put this together. 2024 lunar landing, right? We just got the great Dr. Uh, Robert Foster saying that the moon is a plasma. So we know that they on that wing wham. Off top, they on that cavalry, right? Listen close as of this mouth, you know, to this 2024 situation. Remember, man, Feeney is crisscrossing on your head. Bang. Five people in a couple of years. Obviously, we need to not be making craters, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, otherwise, like, top end, like, we're going to Mars. Not be making craters. We're talking craters. We're talking plasma moon. We're talking craters. I mean, it's a lot of. It's a lot of any windows, man. Let's go. No, not quite. Not yet. <laughs> um, got some work to do, but make, make rapid progress. I think if the we gotta make sure we're, we're accelerating yeah. the rate of innovation, and then. I mean, why do they seem so shook about the moon? They have they have no certainty in their eye bones about this moon business, man. They rather go to Mars than the moon. Why are they so shook, man? Is it a plasma? <laughs> Thank you. Now we have Eric Styler with Wired. Pay attention. Uh, greetings. Uh, congratulations to everybody. Um, Senator Bill Nelson mentioned a, a 2024 uh, timetable for, for a, a lunar landing uh, with HLS during a, a confirmation hearing on Capitol Hill. And I'm just wondering... Uh, from Elon, whether that's uh, kind of a crazy talk, or is that uh, something you feel optimistic about? Crazy talk. I, I think that can be done. Um, yeah, I, I think so. Mm. Um, they should, man. I think we're, yeah. Wow. We're, 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 both, we're both gonna put a lot of rockets in there. They are shook. This dude just had a whole glitch when he brought up the lunar landing. Now, the great Dr. Foster done told us if the moon is a plasma, what would make Elon glitch out like this? Eric Tyler was fired. Uh, greetings. Uh, congratulations to everybody. Um, Senator Bill Nelson mentioned a, a 2024 uh, timetable for, for a, a lunar landing. Uh, through HLS during uh, a confirmation hearing on Capitol Hill. And I'm just wondering uh, from Elon whether that's uh, kind of a crazy talk or is that uh, something you feel optimistic about? Crazy talk. I, I think that can be done. Um, yeah, I, I think so. Um, I think we're, yeah. Do y'all believe it? What's wrong with Elon, man? This is who you're putting your trust into before it was Admiral Burr. It was the great explorer, Admiral Burr. Oh, he has a diary. He's all in this hollow earth situation. And the hollow earth just means he's going within Ama, within the earth, with the, the caverns, the caves. I mean, it don't mean... You're on a ball with a hollow earth. You're on a flat plane with levels to it, man. The secret diary of Admiral Byrne. I mean, he was the great explorer. The greatest explorer of all time. <laughs> there is left in the world today an area as big as the United States that has never been seen by a human being. Come on, boss. And that's beyond the pole. And on the other side of the South Pole from Little America. 
Come on, man. This is their great explorer. Today, he would be an astronaut. This would be Buzz Aldrin today. <laughs> They'll put a spacesuit on him and say, all right, I need you to explore, boss, but they're going to think you're in outer space. They can't know that you're finding, and you definitely can't be talking about it, uh, sir. <laughs> you can't be talking about finding a world the size of America beyond the South Pole point because then we got to make our damn ball a little bigger, and they need to know that they're on a ball. They're on a ball, boss. Okay. Give them their globe, boss. <laughs> That's too easy, man. It's too easy. This is the great explorer. The greatest explorer of all time. He would be like, all right, you got Columbus. <laughs> then you got Admiral Byrne. All right. Then you got uh, Buzz Aldrin in there. You know what I'm saying? So, all right. He's just looking for more land. More land. That Elon be glitching, man. Be crazy, man. <laughs> I don't know what Elon be talking about, man. What were, I mean, what's wrong with Elon, man? Um, yeah, I, I think so. Um, I think we're, yeah. All right, man. Elon tripping. Okay, so you putting your trust in Elon to take it out of space. We just got outer space. I mean, they can't give you these images. That's why they ain't gone back in 50 years. They can't give the public nothing like this. Look at this, man. Look at this, man. And it's sad because they really sold our people on this, man. This was their proof of going to the moon, Jack. Coming into view on the right, carrying the two experiments. I'd say after the end of that next. the same ignition. I mean, it's the same lunar, you know, uh, vessel uh, that they had to launch with. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> this is the ignition pad. All right, so it looks like a bunch of tin foil, man. Uh, next one we'll leave, Wouldn't that be a pretty good place? This guy over here. Look at these people, man. Look at them. Acting like they're somewhere. Yeah, but, uh, uh, Do you believe that they're on the moon right now? Why would they give us this type of footage, man? And the public goes crazy over it. You believe it, man? They they couldn't turn the camera at all, right? But they couldn't turn the camera so we could see these damn experiments. They just went out of view. They just went out of view. But somehow they were able to turn the camera <laughs> so we can view this <laughs> mother sucking ignition, man. <laughs> All right, this is supposed to be the same vessel you just saw.
never in the history of Cappadocia. Stop the cavalry, man. You stop it right now. Never in the history of Catherine. <laughs> you see how they just tilted up? But they couldn't turn the camera so we could see these experiments, though, right? Now the camera's turning just fine, boss. But oh, you're out of our view. We can't see your damn experiment. You stop it right now. Never in the history of Catherine. Take a witness. Oh, look how nice they turn in the camera, boss. They turn in the camera just fine now, boss. But somehow, here, they're just out of view. Sorry, we, we can't turn the camera, boss. Man, they over there in Arizona right now, man. <laughs> this is just Arizona, man. This is ridiculous. Arizona is coming into view on the right, carrying the two experiments. <laughs> Now that's uh, Admiral Byrd. <laughs> that's Buzz Aldrin. Can we see the experiments, boss? You think they on the move? camera's field of view while setting up these experiments. <laughs> so now, now the camera can't turn. But the same vessel was just popping off some ignitions, right, Bo? Y'all better stop this stuff right now. Y'all better turn that heat off. <laughs> yeah, oh, ignition, ignition, ignition. Look at this stuff, man. It's ridiculous, man. Oh, look at that camera turn. They couldn't put a camera so we could see the earth spinning. It's been 50 years. I would think they want to prove something. Hey, side note, thinking about this word Caucasian. <laughs> Someone suggested I put it in the uh, Webster Dictionary. Uh, shout out to my nine. I think it was on IG. It said, Caucasian, caucus. <laughs> Noun. A word used in America to denote a meaning of citizens. Uh-oh. Say, God, oh. <laughs> I know they got the caucuses in the mountains over there, but is that just a cover story for these Caucasians or just the caucus? The meeting of citizens? And these citizens meet to agree upon candidates to be proposed uh, for election and offices. 
So within their corporation, they have caucuses or Caucasians. It's 1828, Noah Webster Dictionary, boss. Just a meeting of citizens. You want to become a citizen of their caucus? <laughs> so you could uh, propose people for your offices and make a vow or vote to whoever. Most however, everything. No vowing, man. No voting, no vowing. We vow to Hawaii or to concert measures for supporting a party. The origin of the word is not ascertained, like the Templar be saying. If they're telling you it's nothing around before these times, it might not really be anything in existence. I mean, there is a Caucasian. They spell it a little different, though. Matter of fact, I think I got it up right. <laughs> oh, Caucasian. How come they don't spell it like this no more? Now you're pertaining to the Caucasus in Asia. <laughs> oh, but you got to be a Caucasian. <laughs> That's not a Caucasian like y'all be saying. Y'all spell it like this. Y'all talking citizen. Ah, just just a side note on Caucasian. <laughs> hey man, let's jump back in here with the preacher, man. Man, he's doing his thing. Shout out to KBN Television, and we're just surfing away. Got a few more drops, man, and hope you're enjoying Flat Drop One on One Part Three. Testament that talks about what the firmament is. In the Old Testament, the prophet Ezekiel describes the throne room of God looking up through the firmament from below. And the angelic creatures are below the firmament, and the throne of God is above the firmament. Now, Brother Mike mentioned one of his favorite chapters in the Bible is uh, Ezekiel's dry bones. Next week, we're going to see the chapter where Ezekiel's talking about uh, Ezekiel's wheel. Um, but we'll save that for next week when we look at some other things to do with cosmology. But for tonight, this is what Ezekiel says about the firmament. Ezekiel is on the earth. He has a vision of God's throne room in heaven. And so he's looking up through the firmament at the throne of God. Listen to his description. And the likeness of the firmament above the heads of the living creature was as the color of the terrible crystal stretched forth over their heads above. And under the firmament were their wings straight. And he goes on to describe the, uh, the living creature that's below the firmament. Then look down here uh, to the next bold sentence. And there was a voice from the firmament that was over their heads. And when they stood and had let down their wings, and above the firmament that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone. So, the throne of God is above the firmament. The living creature he saw was below the firmament. The firmament was in the middle. How did, how did Ezekiel describe the firmament? Did he describe it as just an expanse of space? Did he describe it just as air or atmosphere? No. Look what he described. It. He described it as the terrible crystal. That is, that's a crystal. Some kind of a mineral, a hard mineral crystal is defined as a hard solid mineral characterized by multifaceted smooth surfaces so whatever my naga these are body bags on body bags so are you getting this body bag it's so much evidence to support our investigation and their so-called facts ain't got no evidence, no validation. The rockets don't work in a vacuum. <laughs> They're not accounting for any curvature of the earth when they're building these 700 mile long bridges. We're going to get that. We're going to get that. They're not accounting for this when they're building their thousand long tra uh, you know, uh, train tracks. They're not accounting for no curvature. <laughs> 
And here we got Ezekiel breaking down that the crystal, this terrible crystal is the firmament. Connect that with the sapphire stone and the sapphire staff of creation. Let go. Ezekiel is calling the firmament. He's saying it's a crystal. It's a hard, solid, whatever it is, with just like a crystal, a smooth, multifaceted parts to it, faces to it. Now, I put a picture over here of a geodesic dome so you could get a picture of what a crystal dome would look like. That's what Ezekiel is describing, looking from down here up at the firmament. Right now, Ezekiel gives us a view of the firmament looking up through it at the throne of God. The next passage we're about to see is from the New Testament, from the book of Revelation. And it's John's view of the firmament. But remember when John was caught up to the throne room of God in the beginning of the book of Revelation, he's actually in the throne room, throne room of God. So whereas Ezekiel gives us the view of the firmament looking up through it, John saw the firmament looking down through it. So let's see what John says about it. In the New Testament, the Apostle John describes the throne room of heaven looking down at the firmament. Revelation 4, 6 records, And before the throne there was a sea of glass like unto crystal. Amazingly, the very same word that Ezekiel used for it, looking up through it. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts. Look, uh, John saw the same crystal that Ezekiel saw from below. And in Revelation, the firmament is presented as a sea of glass directly in front of the throne of God. It's his footstool. The firmament with the earth attached to it is the footstool of God at the throne. Isaiah 66, 1 says, Thus saith the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Matthew 5, 34 and 35 says, But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool. So here you see a representation of the throne of God and the sea of glass underneath the throne of God where he would put his feet which is the firmament mm. above our earth below. And just imagine Moses' staff and the staff of Adam, staff of Abraham, the staff of, 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 of Isaac and Jacob, Joseph. This staff looking just like this, the staff of the Presta made out of this same sapphire, my God. Who they call the terrible crystal because it performs mighty wonders. There we have in the Bible a view of the firmament looking up through it and a view of the firmament looking down through it. Both of them describe it as a crystal, whatever it is. Like a tent over the earth. Apparently Moses... Job and David were not the only ones who understood that the firmament was more than mere space, that it was something which enclosed space, like a tent. A tent is not a tent if it is mere open space. It must have something which is enclosing the space inside of it in order for it to be a tent. So in other words, if, if, if we just said, uh, hey, TR, we're going to go camping out here. In the graveyard tonight, PR says, oh, I'd be okay with that. I don't know if the preacher would be, but he'd be okay with it. But if we said, uh, we're going to go out and sleep in a tent, why well, you'd be expecting me to put up some structure that's enclosing some space. Otherwise, it's not a tent. It's just... And a tent has foundations. Back to the Hebrew language, like we got the kaug circle, right? The kaug, a physical... A physical object, kawug, circle, roundness, enclosure. Something is being compassed within. A tent. Like a tent wall before that, 
you get your cutoff day, your Zion. When you came through that door, when mama was crying out, when you walked through that door, big mama was crying out, right? Proverbs. Uh, let's go chapter eight. Just thinking about big mama right quick, y'all. Don't mind me. Does not wisdom cry? We're talking about mama crying out when you walk through the door. Rock with me now. We're about to get to the wall, right? We're about to get to the tent peg. You got that strong power, that L, that, that Aleph, <laughs> that Baat, that floor plan. It's a tent floor plan. It's about... It's always about this tent, you know. Same thing we're getting in Isaiah 40 is being cooperated in your structured language in the Pictopaleo, Hebrew. Something about this tent needs to have foundations, just like the earth needs foundations. The strong power goes into this tent floor plan or your family or your house, goes in it, inside. And now you're starting to gather and tribe up and and walk towards what? You gom towards what? This foot, you're, you're moving where? Through a door, through an entrance, through a portal, through a vortex. So you gather after this strong power enters your floor plan of your tent. You start to move. <laughs> Gather, move through a what? Entrance, a door. You get your, not man with arms raised. Your mama is your, your father is your, wow. That exhale is your tent peg, your added security, your hook, because that tent floor plan needed security. The breath needs security. That revelation you're getting right now needs to be secure like the tent peg that secures the tent so you can get your food your zion your zanzan your shabbat your cut off day your nourishment from your ama your mother who was crying out with breath with revelation trying to get you to look what she say mama does not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice. She stands in top of high places by the way in the places of the past. My, my mama says she at the entrance. She cries at the gates, at the door, the door. That doll, right when you got through that doll, you got that look. Mama's telling you to look. She got something to reveal to you. She got to give you some breath. She's crying to you. She's calling you thoughtless just to give you this breath. She cried at the gates, at the entry of the city, at the coming in, at the doors. <laughs> the doll you got, they put man because they're hiding your mama. Man with arms raised. That's your, hey, hey, that's your look. That's your breath. That's Ama. Your father is this security, the Papuva, the mind, you know, uh, sacred text. The cliche breaks it down as a framer and a shaper. She got the ingredients to give you that look, to give you that breath. He forms you, shapes you, gives you that security, secures your vibration, secures your floor plan, because it all started with the strong power, most high over everything. Now you got it secure. The tent floor plan is now secured by the tent peg or the wah. You ain't breathing out the wah. You ain't breathing out security. 
so you can build your wall, your tent wall. After you eat, you can get your food, your cut off. You're getting cut off from the hijack. You got peace, man. You got salvation. That means you got nourishment. Then you can build your wall. <laughs> hey, out to my cons, man. Every day I check, I see a nugget, you know, giving love, man. You know, putting in at work. Eric McWilliams, what it do, man. Hey, hop to your brother, Eric, David A., all my noggins. We building a wall. But first, we had to get in code, take these steps. Get our hawa. We got our hawa. We got our zan. We were able to get our food. We, we ate. Mama fed us. Because <laughs> mama's been crying out for us. At the entry. At the coming in at the doors unto you, O man, I call, and my voice is to the sons of man. O oh, you simple, understand wisdom. You fools, be you of an understanding heart. Here, for I will speak of excellent things, and opening the opening of my lips shall be right things. We're talking about that breath. <clears throat> Mama sound like she got a revelation, right? Like she is revealing something. Man with arms raised. This is Ama, big mama with her arms raised. Now you see it. This is big mama crying out at the gates, <laughs> at the coming in of the door, the doll. She crying out to all my nuggets. She's like, man, you must be thoughtless if you ain't thinking about big mama. You don't have an understanding of wisdom. Be of an understanding heart, man. <laughs> Here for I will speak of excellent things and opening the opening of my lips shall be right things. For my mouth shall speak truth and wickedness is an abomination of my lips. I can't speak nothing but truth to you. Oh, why? It's not just letting mama pop off. Mama's popping off because mama been popping off. Yeah. Mama's already here. And if you don't got that breath, how are you going to have your security? And if you have your security, how long are you going to have it without mama giving you the ingredients to fortify your kingdom, which is what Solomon is praying, praying for, wisdom and discernment. He needs that look. He needs that revelation. The same revelation, mama's saying that I will speak excellent things, right things truth you want that drop when you want that drop you want that revelation you want that breath you got to walk through the door when you walk through the door mama gonna cry out to you first you got to gather you got to walk you got to get there you only get that through the inspiration of our strong power if a water want to wake you up and pop you off, make you aware you ain't going to pop off. You can't try to reverse engineer this thing and say, oh, look, they popping off. Let me act like I'm a cold keeper. Let me act like I'm popping off with them. Let me, you know, use their slango and seem like I'm tribing, tribing, and vibing, vibing. But you ain't even had the strong power in your house. You just saw something on the internet or you just saw somebody that you thought, you know what I'm saying, you could uh, attach yourself to. You know, maybe you just needed some energy. You didn't come to serve. You didn't come to really walk through that door. Mama wasn't calling out to you. We can't front on this. We can't fake this, man. This drop that's flowing out, this water that's flowing. This is a revelation, man. This is big mama. Even the hater got to see that truth is truth. We got security because we got that. <gasps> wow. That existence. We're proving the existence of Hawa. So we can all eat. Yeah, we got a tent wall. Okay. Like a tent. <laughs> Over the earth, man. Let's get a little more of this. Preacher, man. Space. Well, so too is the word tent in the Bible. Look at what Isaiah says. Have ye not understood from the foundations of the earth? 
It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Remember, the word circle is not the word for ball. It's the word for circle. Let's go. And the inhabitants thereof are as grasshoppers. That stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. Isaiah 44, verse 24 says, I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone. Isaiah 45, 12, I, even my hands, have stretched out the heavens, and all their hosts have I commanded. The host of the heavens commanded by God are in the firmament, and we'll talk more about the host of heavens next week. Ms. Kelly asked a question about that a few weeks ago, the stars and so forth. We're going to look at those in depth next week as we finish up our study. That, here's that verse again. Here's, here's that same picture we saw of what a, the circle of the earth with a tent over it would look like. It is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth that stretch. And look at these tent pegs, right? This tent, this canopy got it. Got these ten pegs because it has to be immovable, firm, fixed, my naga. This is scripture, not religion. This is Hawaii's earth, and we are proving it. Stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in. You can't have a tent unless there's something that's enclosing something. So there's a picture of what a tent over a circle would look like. Here is what the ancient Hebrews pictured the earth with the vaulted dome of heaven above it looking like, the firmament above it. There's really no literal way to take the Bible without drawing something that looks a whole lot like this. And uh, Brother Kevin and I were joking around. Uh, there are a lot of people who describe this as looking like a snow globe. You know, that you shake up at Christmas time and let it sit there and watch the snow fall down. That's what it looks like. But there's no way you can take the Bible literally and not walk away thinking that that's what the earth looks like that God created. Here's where it starts to get interesting. Now, we're going, we, we've done tonight like we've done every week. We've established what the Bible says about the subject we're talking about tonight, which is the firmament. You've seen lots of verses about what the Bible describes as the firmament. Now we're going to see how that relates to things in our own lifetime, in modern times, how science relates to what we've seen in the Bible. If, in fact, the firmament is a solid dome that stretches out over the earth, and is bound to it as described in scripture, has man discovered the edge where the dome and the earth meet, or even perhaps the ceiling of the dome up above? Some interesting things apparently related to the firmament began to happen shortly after the end of World War II. Everything that I'm about to show you is very well documented, and not by just by people that believe in biblical cosmology. You can look all these things up for yourselves. You can see way more than what I'm going to show tonight. Uh, but this is to give you a, a, a little bit of a glimpse that the world is acknowledging something or seems to be acknowledging something that we just saw out of the Bible. Operation High Jump. From August of 1946, this is one year after World War II ended, to February of 47, Rear Admiral Richard Byrd led a U.S. military expedition to Antarctica to make sure, at least this was the ostensible reason for him going, to make sure that German U-boat bases that existed at one part of Antarctica claimed by Germany in 1939, just prior to the outset of the war, were no longer there, that there were no more German bases there. One of the stated purpose of this, purposes of this mission was, quote, consolidating and extending the United States sovereignty over the largest practicable area of the Antarctic continent. They co-named it Operation High Jump because the hurdle they would have to uh, accomplish of mounting the 200-foot high cliffs of the ice wall that totally surrounds Antarctica. 
This ice wall is believed by proponents of the flat earth to extend not around the continent stuck to the bottom of the ball, but to be the ice wall around the flat earth, around the circle of the flat earth. And as we saw before, that is the description of what the Bible says, that the boundaries of mankind that holds in the seas. By the way, that's the reason you couldn't fall off anything because there's a 200 foot ice wall holding all the waters in. And then there's a, a dome attached to it at some point that goes up above the earth as well. But the dome has to be attached at some point because the Bible very clearly said that uh, the, the firmament is as a troop. It's attached. It's binding the earth to the heavens. Even today, there's much controversy about Admiral Byrd's task force and what it discovered while in Antarctica on this expedition that included an aircraft carrier, a submarine, a dozen additional warships, and nearly 5,000 troops. This, this was a military expedition. He says it. You can, you can go online and hear his own words. He says this was a military expedition. Byrd returned to the States and immediately began to plan a series of additional explorations in Antarctica. Supposedly, they did not find any German bases there. Whether they did or didn't is not relevant to what we're talking about tonight. But whatever Admiral Byrd found there caused him to immediately start making plans to return to Antarctica. And in all, I think he had a series of five different expeditions to Antarctica because he found something there that was worth exploring and looking at again. Now, this brings us to a 30-second video. And I think I've found a good way to be able to show this without having any technical problems tonight. Lord willing. In 19... Fair use in your caboose bowl. Let's get a couple more minutes and make a beautiful dismount. Flat drop 101. In 55, two years before his death, Admiral Richard Byrd departs on his fifth and last expedition. But it's not simply an unknown continent or a distant ocean that lures adventurers like Richard Byrd. As he put it, here is a door ajar through which one may escape from the noise and chaos of civilization into the solace and harmony of the cosmos. A door ajar, an open door, an open gate. Gateway through the firmer man. And for a moment, be part of it. All right. Hopefully you, you heard what he said there. Become part of it. Yes, sir. All right, so back to our slide presentation here. So what did Admiral Byrd mean? He said, escape so that you can become one with the cosmos for a brief moment. Become one with the cosmos in Antarctica? Is the cosmos, which we usually think of as outer space, is that something you usually think of and connect when you think of Antarctica? Body Do you think of the cosmos when you think of Antarctica? I think of penguins and seals. I don't know what you think of. I don't think of the cosmos when I think of Antarctica. Preacher man got some body bags, man. I'm not going to say what he did or didn't mean, but it certainly is a very elusive statement that he made. What did Admiral Byrd know about Antarctica that made him think about becoming one with the cosmos while there? And why did he keep going back to Antarctica until he died? There was something he found in Antarctica that stirred his interest. You, we can speculate as to what it was, but I'm going to give you some possible ideas here. Operation Deep Freeze. Beginning in 1955, Admiral Byrd led a series of additional explorations in Antarctica after high jump in an attempt to penetrate further than before and to photograph as much of Antarctica as possible. The Soviet Union at the same time 
was also pursuing its own explorations of Antarctica simultaneously. Four years later, in 1959, the United States assembled 66 nations to sign the first of a series of international agreements known as the Antarctic, Tre Antarctic Treaty System, which limits access to Antarctica to approved persons only and approved purposes only. Treaties of peace and friendship, right? They're making treaties with this confederate, this caucus <laughs> is making treaties on your head bone to keep you uh, blind, deaf, and dumb to reality. These agreements are still enforced today. By the way, those 66 nations that are all parties to the Antarctic Treaty, they together form the police that makes sure no one goes to Antarctica without having proper authorization from the treaty authority. You can't just go down to Antarctica if you decide to go down to Antarctica. You've got to get permission from the treaty authority to go to Antarctica. And of course, the reasons they would allow you to go, where they would allow you to go, are very limited, to say the least, even if you had the money and the wherewithal to go to a place that would require the kind of resources that it would require. But did you also know that of the 66 nations that have signed on to this authority, it's not just the United States, but the Soviet Union and what is today Russia are two of the signatories on this treaty system. So whatever's in this treaty system, both the United States and Russia have agreed to go by the terms of it. Kind of interesting that even while it was the Soviet Union and we were supposedly at odds with one another, the two superpowers of the world, we both signed on to this same treaty. All right, so think about all the hijack today, all these so-called, oh, Putin's going to do this, uh, China's going to do that. Managa, they are working together. That is a puppet show. They have bigger fish to fry. They got worlds beyond the poles to deal with. They ain't got, this is a political puppet show, man, just to keep you entertained. Because both the U.S. and the Soviets were in favor of keeping anybody else out of Antarctica. We'll continue on. It's been suggested that one of the reasons for the rush to get all the nations of the world to agree to restrict access to Antarctica may be to prevent the world from finding out what bird and his expeditions discovered there possibly even where the firmament meets the earth at some point distantly inland from the 200-foot ice walls. A preacher, are you saying that's what they found? I'm not saying that's what they found. I've never been to Antarctica. I'm not ever going to go to Antarctica. But the truth is, you're not ever going to go to Antarctica. Let's go, preacher, man. But their suspicious behavior leads one to believe they could have discover the firmament. You say, what suspicious behavior are you talking about, preacher? I'm about to show you. Preacher, man. Simul simultaneous with Bird's discoveries in Antarctica, a string of actions related to rockets and space exploration started on both the Soviet and American sides. After he discovers whatever he discovers in Antarctica, and after the Russians get there about the same time and find whatever they find there, both countries start doing some very interesting things at the same time, in addition to both signing this treaty, keeping everybody out of Antarctica. NASA, Nazis, Disney, and the occult. Now, this is really for a whole night by itself. I'm going to come back to this at a later time after we finish this Bible study, because I've already put a whole lot of time and research into this one for you, too. Mm -hmm. In the midst of the U.S. and Soviet race to explore Antarctica, both nations suddenly agreed to restrict human travel to Antarctica, and they both became preoccupied with trying to get to outer space. Bang! But they're really making linear models for flat, non-rotating Earth surfaces, man. Now, we know that they both got <clears throat> rocket scientists from Nazi Germany that they captured, and both the U.S. and the Soviet Union took off with their their rocket program so we understand that but there's a little more to it than just that 
1955, the man, Walt Disney, not the company, but the man who started the company, a member of the Masonic organization, Demolay, collaborated on a film with former Nazi rocket scientist Werner von Braun entitled Man in Space. By the way, I, I'm going to say more about Werner von Braun in that later study. He wrote a fictional story in which he talks about Mars being settled by mankind at some point. And the title of the president of the Mars colony, by the way, is named Elon. I'll just leave that. You can do with it what you want to do. Uh oh. In 1957, by the way, they always telegraph what they're going to do long before they ever do it to us. Uh oh. In 1957, the Soviet Union launched Sputnik to explore space. That's 57. Right after both the U.S. and Soviets found whatever they found in Antarctica. The Soviets put up the first satellites, but <coughs> the next year, in 1958, the U.S. created NASA for the purpose of space exploration, trying to keep up with the Joneses over there in the Soviet Union. Simultaneously, so all this is happening in the midst of this race to explore Antarctica. Now we're talking about exploring space and getting us crazy about NASA. What's it got to do with Nazis? Obviously, the U.S. government also created DARPA, which is the Department of Advanced Research Projects Agency, so that they would have an agency for all of their black budget defense projects that are so advanced they don't let us know what they're doing, except using our money. One of the earliest acquisitions of NASA was the Jet Propulsion Laboratories in California, JPL which was started by the occultist Jack Parsons. He was a rocket scientist, but he was also a follower of the Satanist Aleister Crowley. Parsons was also associated with L. Ron Hubbard, the fellow who founded Scientology, who was also a, a, a follower of Aleister Crowley. There was and is a strong connection throughout the entire history of NASA with Freemasons, Nazis, and Illuminists and occultists. Again, that's for another study, but it's going to be eye-opening and mind-boggling when we finally do that one day. Um, Werner von Braun, the Nazi that was brought over here, he was, of course, part of Nazi Germany as well. So the connection to Freemasons, Nazis, and occultists. Here's what NASA began doing after whatever Admiral Byrd discovered in Antarctica. In 1962, NASA commenced with Operation Dominic. Now, Dominic literally means of the Lord. Uh, Anno Domini means in the year of our Lord. Operation Dominic means the operation of the Lord. A series of 31 high-altitude atomic explosions using rockets, including the Thor missile. You know who Thor is. Uh, Abigail knows who Thor is. He's He's one of those superheroes, right? He's got the hammer that smashes things. Uh, he's the, the Nordic Superman. That was the name for one of the rockets that... Zeus, which is who they worship. NASA started launching straight up with high-altitude missiles with uh, very, very uh, high tonnage of explosives exploding them as far up as they could get them. The Soviets began to launch their own high-altitude atomic rockets at the same time. The same year, as part of Operation Dominic, NASA expanded the, the project to include Operation Fishbowl, in which rockets are launched into high altitudes carrying explosive atomic yields in excess of 1.4 megaton yields. That's a hundred times more powerful than the atomic bomb we dropped on Hiroshima. That's what they're sending up and exploding as high up as they can get on these Thor missiles and other missiles. Less than a decade after Admiral Byrd discovered whatever he discovered at Antarctica, an international treaty with cooperation from both the U.S. and Soviets closed Antarctica to all civilians, and both the U.S. and Soviets began launching high-altitude rockets as high as possible 
carrying megatons of explosive yields. It, it almost seems like they were trying to see if they could get through something. They were using Thor's hammer. Remember, these are occultists. They all use the same page, pagan symbology uh, that they've used all the way back to Mystery Babylon. Different names in different cultures, but it's the same mythology. It's part of their religion. It sure looks like NASA was using the hammer of Thor to try to bust through whatever they thought was up there. NASA launched Thor rockets carrying atomic warheads into space as part of Operation Dominic and the sub-Operation Fishbowl. Uh, Operation Fishbowl. You put Dominic and Fishbowl together, it literally means Fishbowl of the Lord. Now, let me just stop for one minute right here. And if you say, preacher, I just don't, I think you're trying to pull too many things together that you're just trying to make things fit. Wait a minute. This is NASA. They claim they don't believe the Bible, but whatever they're shooting missiles at up there, the name of their operation is the fishbowl operation. Now, I don't know about where you grew up, but where I grew up, a fishbowl only looks like one thing. It looks like a fishbowl. So NASA, their name for things, they're saying they're launching missiles in Operation Fishbowl of the Lord. If it's not something up there that looks like a fishbowl, <laughs> They certainly created a lot of uh, room for controversy by getting. And this is what we got <clears throat> at the top of uh last uh last drop. Go get those drops, man. The flat drops, brand new series. I'm just approaching it, man, with a dragonfly perspective. On my nagas right here in the fifth wave, man. And just body bags on body bags. What are they doing? I mean, shooting rockets into outer space and losing a bunch of rockets knowing they're going to go into the vacuum of space? Or do they expect collision? And that's right after they really discovered they could probably only navigate so far. Maybe they couldn't get through certain gateways like Admiral Burr was just breaking down these gateways. We're going to get a lot more of this uh, Flat Earth Bible, man. Next time we'll talk about Oh, I'm going to this uh, Enoch flow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to go into the Enoch flow. I'm just going to leave it up for next time. We're also going to go into the worlds beyond the pole next time. I think we're ready for it. But first, we had to establish some foundational, you know, understanding that we can build and uh, be firm, fixed, and movable, have that hawa, have that breath and security, have that, have that tent peg. Since the, you know, <laughs> Shamaim is spread out like a tent. Right. <laughs> What's in your floor plan, man? What power, you know, are you popping off with? What tribe are you gathering with? And what door are y'all walking through together? What breath of security are y'all breathing together? What, what food are you eating together? And what wall are you building together? We just popping off. Let's go. A <laughs> hundred proofs. The earth is not a glow. By W.M. W.M. Carpenter. Dropped in, I think, 1885 on the head bone of John Hopkins, man. I just want to pick it up because I was talking about that uh, 700 mile long. You know. Let's go. 700 miles is said to be the length of the Great Canal in China. So we talked about a bridge. They're talking about a canal that was built. Certain it is that when this canal was formed, no allowance or no regard <laughs> was made for curvature. 700 miles, they would have to at least do the math and know every mile we got to dip this thing six inches. When an airplane pilot, <laughs> pilot is flying across the world, across the plane, is he constantly dipping his nose down every mile, 
six inches to make sure he don't fly off the ball. Oh, he just casually is going around the ball. And then he goes to the other side. Now he's upside down on the other side of the ball. Stop it, balls. Just stop it, man. Stop the capery, man. No allowance is made for curvature when you're talking this canal, this great canal in China or bridges or railroad tracks. This is 700 miles. You're going to have to have substantial curvature. I mean, <laughs> it's flat drop 101. We got a calculator, man. Why not? We got a calculator? All right. Uh, 700 miles times six equals, okay, 4,200 <clears throat> 4, miles, or, uh, sorry, 4,200 inches, two miles. <laughs> okay. So almost 10%, you know, a little half of that, you know what I'm saying? Almost, uh, you know, getting, you know, to that, you know, 6%, 7% of a mile. All right, you get it, you get it. 7% of a mile, man. All right. No accounting for curvature. Earth must curve. Every mile. Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. The Earth curves at approximately eight inches per mile square. Thank you, boss. They even got an Earth curvature calculator, man. Yeah. All right. Eight inches, man. Let's just go back. <laughs> 700. That's how many miles this Chinese canal is. Times eight equals fifty six. Okay, fifty six hundred inches to miles. Oh, oh, we almost getting to the ten percent. I kept, I kept saying that because you know somehow I just knew it was closer to ten percent. <laughs> almost nine percent, ten percent of a mile, and they didn't account for zero curvature in building this 700 mile long canal you're on a ball they're saying you must be curving earth must curve man you're on a ball approximately 8 inches per mile They're telling you you can't have no flat, you know, water, stretching miles of flat water. You can't have no flat railroads and no flat bridges. And in this case, no flat canals. No allowance is made for curvature, yet the canal is a fact without it. This is a Chinese proof that the earth is not a globe. Number 68, this is 100 proof dropped on the head bone of John Hopkins University and their science team, their program. They, he said, look, man, y'all on that wing web, and here's the proof. Mr. J.N. Lockler says, quote, because the sun seems to rise in the east and set in the west, the earth really spins in the opposite direction, that is, from west to east. <laughs> now, this is no better than though we were to say, because a man seems to be coming up the street, the street really goes down to the man. And since true science will contain no such nonsense as this, it follows that the so-called science of theoretical astronomy is not true, and therefore we have a proof that the Earth is not a globe. Number 69, Mr. Lockler says, he's talking to these, you know, professors and scientists. <laughs> the appearances connected with the rising and the setting of the sun and stars may be due either to our Earth being at rest and the sun and stars traveling around it, or the earth itself turning around while the sun and stars are at rest, 
Now, since true science does not allow of any such beggarly alternatives as these, it is the plain, it is plain that modern theoretical astronomy is not true science and that it is leading dogma. Its leading dogma is a fallacy. We have then a plain proof that the earth is not a globe. Let's get number 70. Mr. Locklear says, in describing his picture of the supposed proof of the earth's rotundity by means of ships rounding a hill of water, we hear this one a lot, uses these words, quote, diagram showing how when we suppose the earth is round, we explain how it is that ships at sea appear as they do. This is utterly unworthy of the name of science, a science that begins with supposing and ends with explaining the supposition. Is from beginning to end a mere farce. The men who can do nothing better than amuse themselves in this way must be denounced as dreamers only, and their leading dogma a delusion. This is proof that the earth is not a globe because you put a high powered telescope, you're going to still see that ship going straight, boss. It didn't curve over no hill of water. You go from California to Hawaii, you think you went over this big hill of water. Water's curving into a ball, boss. Stop it, man. Last one we'll get, number 71. <clears throat> the astronomer's theory of a globular, globular Earth necessitates the conclusion that if we travel south on the equator, south of the equator, to see the North Star is an impossibility. Yet it is well known this star has been seen by navigators when they have been more than 20 degrees south of the equator. This fact, like hundreds of others, puts the theory to shame and gives us a proof the earth is not a globe. Y'all want one more, man? 72. Astronomers tell us that in consequence of the earth's rotundity, the perpendicular walls of buildings are nowhere parallel and that even the walls of houses on opposite sides of the street are not strictly so. But since all observation fails to find any evidence of this want of parallelism, which theory demands, the idea must be renounced as being absurd and in opposition to all well-known facts. This is a proof that the earth is not a globe. Oh, man. The supposed rotundity. They want to talk about perpendicular walls of buildings are nowhere parallel and that even the walls of houses on opposite sides of the street are not strictly so. <laughs> but since all observation fails to find any evidence of this, they just trying to find ways to prove my naga that they're on a ball. One more, man. Astronomers have made experiments with pendulums which have been suspended from the interior of high buildings and have exulted over the idea of being able to prove the rotation of the earth on its Access by the varying direction taken by the pendulum over a prepared table underneath, asserting that the table moved round under the pendulum instead of the pendulum shifting and oscillating in different directions over the table. But since it has been found that as often as not, the pendulum went round the wrong way for the rotation theory. Uh oh, chagrin has taken the place of exhaustion, exult exultation. And we have a proof of the failure of astronomers and their efforts to substantiate their theory and therefore proof the earth is not a globe. Oh, man, there's so many great, you know, because you take this and you go further. You take what he's dropping, you know, recon it further. You know, read it again, man. We've been digging on <laughs> this for a long time. They still... <laughs> trying to get out the Van Allen, man. And I guess uh, maybe the, at least they say, that they was trying to shoot with these nukes, trying to shoot into the Van Allen belt to try to make a pathway to get through the Van Allen belt. And that got us thinking, damn, you really are just talking firmament. Ain't your boss. Ryan, it's Gary. Ryan, it's getting ready to launch.
My name is Kelly Smith, and I work on navigation and guidance for Orion. Orion is NASA's next generation spacecraft. Built with versatility in mind, it can take astronauts deeper into space than we've ever gone before, to an asteroid or even onto Mars. Deeper into space than we've ever gone before. For these missions, Orion has to be one tough spacecraft, withstanding high speeds, searing temperatures, and extreme radiation. Before high speeds, searing astronauts deeper into space than we've ever gone before to an asteroid or even onto Mars. For these missions, Orion has Orion has to be one of the toughest spacecrafts to go places they ain't gone before, like the asteroid, like Mars, uh, like beyond low Earth orbit. This is their checklist, my noggin. After Apollo missions is to get to the asteroid, get to Mars. Hey, how about we just go beyond low Earth orbit? Their checklist is to get out of Earth's orbit because they can't get past the wall, which they're calling the Van Allen radiation belt. Has to be one tough spacecraft, withstanding high speeds, searing temperatures, and extreme radiation. Before we can send astronauts into space on Orion, we have to test all of its systems. And there's only one way to know if we got it right fly it in space. As we get further away from Earth, we'll pass through the Van Allen belts, an area of dangerous radiation. Radiation like this could harm the guidance systems, onboard computers, or other electronics on Orion. Naturally, we have to pass through this danger zone twice, once up and once back. Has it ever happened before, boss? Have you ever got out the wall? We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. So you're still working to solve this challenge before you can send people through this region of outer space beyond low Earth orbit? Anaga, I need you to hear clearly, boss. Before we can send astronauts into space on Orion, we... Okay, before we can send astronauts to test all of its systems and there's only one way to know if we got it right fly it in space as we get further away from earth we'll pass through the van allen belts an area of dangerous radiation radiation like this could harm the guidance systems onboard computers or other electronics on orion naturally we have to pass through this danger zone twice once up and once back we must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. We must solve these challenges before we send people through this region of space. Has it happened already, boss? For this flight, it's time to head home. <laughs> you should have done that in 1969, boss. You should have done that in 1969. You still ain't solved the Van Allen. They ain't going, you know. I don't know how far they can get, man. Uh, I don't know what technologies they're dealing with. I don't know what superpowers they've teamed up with, with citizens, with Caucasians. <laughs> but uh, you see all the effort is to go beyond, right? And then it switched up into outer space. Why is the satellite image of Antarctica not available, boss? <laughs> Nobody lives there permanently. Yeah, man. Ain't, ain't nothing to see here. <laughs> oh, man. Having fun, man. I mean, this is a victory lap. All these presidents always got to go to Antarctica. All these presidents always got to tap into Antarctica, man. Admiral Burr said his landmass bigger than America beyond the South Pole, man. Ain't that what he said? 
And now they got Middle Earth in their crosshairs because they're at war with you. We got to have perspective. Admiral Byrd said he got land. He found land the size of America, boss. North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any unexplored land left on this earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole because it's getting crowded up there now because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by human as big as America, as big as the United States, that's never been seen, that's not going to fit on their ball, and it's not going to be taught in your history class. And not up around the North Pole, because it's getting crowded up there now, because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human beings. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from Middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that unexplored. That's a tremendous... <laughs> I think it's quite astonishing that there are so many worlds beyond the poles. Outside the wall. The Admiral Burr's trying to get to, trying to check in, check in, and tap in, tap in. How many worlds? I mean, Nas Confunding got the drop, you know. You got a lot of worlds going on. Shout out to bro Nas Confunding. Oh, man. <laughs> Popping off, man. Yeah, we popping off, man. Shout out to the cons, Aboriginality, Ab Legend, man. Tasha She, Wild West, Los Angeles, man. Nice Spiral, man. You know, these cons been popping off, man. Yo, Seth the Real, dropping that drop. We've been dropping on them rainbows and all that stuff, man. Love to uh, Nas Confunding. Hey, come over here, surf the wave with us. We just dropping, you know. We just dropping drop over here, man. Uh, now it's confounded, man. Let's get to it. Here we go. So how many more worlds does this thing extend to? You see how many circles these, <laughs> all these are worlds beyond a pole. You get out of one barrier, you get into another barrier. You know, sometimes there's ice, sometimes there's, you know, vegetation and lush you know fields and gardens and you know what i mean it's like it's it's everything beyond is the infinite beyond the wall and Nas is doing great work man you know <laughs> how many worlds beyond the poles man how many suns how many more moons Spiraling in, spiraling out. Old moons, old suns used to be in the middle. But why I got this flowing like a Rolly, like a Rolex. <laughs> All in the flow, man. So, land of Venus, <laughs> land of Hercules, I mean, the Biru. All these are worlds beyond the poles, land of the custodians, the citizens, and the Naki lands. Hey, why not give this map a serious look? If you're giving all the BS maps all your life serious looks, you might as well look into some independent recon and, you know, uh, Nas Kofun and do the recon like none other, man, when it comes to <laughs> beyond the wall. For real, for real, you know. Talking boundaries. All old cosmology showing an enclosure. Look at the rainbow. <laughs> we did the rainbow drop, right? Bouncing off the mirror 
a glass ceiling. <laughs> they searching, boss, man. They searching. Oh, man. All right, man. 178 worlds under the great dome. Wow. Answering some questions, man. Love to the bro. Dizzle Fitty hitting us with some great documentation on this that we read live in the ether. We also shared it on the tube. Just get the drop. Just go to our playlist, click on flat drop, man, and see what you got, man. <laughs> 178 worlds under the great dome. So it was a great firmament, possibly with the 178 worlds within it. And then there's probably lesser domes, you know what I'm saying? I mean, I don't know, boss. I don't know. All, I, all I'm saying is when they're talking planets, <laughs> you're talking land of Neptune, not the spinning ball Neptune, land of Jupiter, not the spinning ball Jupiter, land of Zeus. Oh, yeah, that's that Thor business again. Land of Mars. When they want to get to Mars, oh, Elon, crazy Elon want to get to Mars. He just want to go straight, boss. NASA got the linear flow so they can go straight over a flat, non-rotating Earth, boss. Over a flat, non-rotating Earth, stationary atmosphere, man. Why? Because it's all the same stationary atmosphere. The same air over here is the same air over there. Same type of Earth over here is the same type of Earth over there. And it's funny watching that new show on Hulu, uh, The Orville, as hijacked as it is. When they go to all these worlds and they always land in, it's always the same trees, <laughs> same fauna, same type of mountains. All these worlds look exactly the same because they're telling us that they're all the same. Or, you know, overall, generally speaking, you're not getting into a new atmosphere. It's the same atmosphere. It's the same land. It's Ama. All this is the same. Past the ice, man. Operation High Jump. Nas Kofun didn't know. Here's a actual, I mean, this is a stamp. Official stamp. Operation High Jump, Antarctic Expedition. Look how they're clawing with their anchor over the ice, man. Task Force 68. Is it play play? I mean, we were... We're bringing all this together. How many more worlds beyond the poles, man? For the dismount. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Did the, the U.S. Navy battle UFOs protecting Nazis? Or is that more cover up for this dragon, uh, <laughs> a fleet of dragons beyond the ice? I mean, uh, Preston John, Legends. Preston John and his sources has the Preston John letter talking about these dragons flying, you know, wherever the Preston want these dragons to fly. This cavern of dragons so deep and all this, I mean, this sounds like Antarctica trap. I know they got ran out by dragons, but dragons are unidentified flying objects, are they not? Uh, you know, not that the Nazi flow had nothing to do with it, you know, I just think we got to put it all together. It wasn't just about fighting Nazis. Are you on a plane or are you on a planet? <laughs> you on a spinning ball or a flat surface? NASA wants to create flat, non-rotating, linear flying, <laughs> stationary, atmosphere, you know, type of uh, aircraft, you know not outer space warp machines that's bending space and time as they travel. You're just going straight, boss, to get to the lands beyond the pole. Planet or plane, don't let them dissuade you from the right path. They're very devious. Mama's crying out. All the words of my mouth are unrighteousness. There's nothing forward and perverse. You need mama to see clearly, man. To get out the spell of their Baal. They are all plain to him that understands and right to them that find gold. Receive my instruction and not silver. 
Knowledge rather than choice gold. For wisdom is better than rubies and all things that may be desired or not to be compared to it. I, Ama, wisdom, dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. Okay. NASA. <laughs> the fear, the respect of Hawa is to hate evil, pride, and arrogance. Okay, NASA. Okay, SpaceX. And the evil way and the forward mouth do I hate because they are on that capery. They are lying. Their mouths are forward. Counsel is mine. Sound wisdom. I am understanding. I have strength. We're talking big mama with her arms raised. Not a man with his arms raised. Mama says she crying out. She is understanding. She has strength by me, king's reign, and prince's decree, justice. The Khan's reign because of Amma's understanding ingredients. Are you listening? Or are you just one of these thoughtless? <laughs> Don't be thoughtless, man. You know, mama got an issue with you being thoughtless. Mama wants you to be righteous because she leads in the way of righteousness. And we're getting out of this hijack, man, brick by brick. While as yet he made the earth, right? We got foundations, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. Where's the highest part on your ball? The people on the bottom would say they at the highs. <laughs> the people on the side would say they at the highs. But everybody sees the same horizon. That that ship has to go over the hill of water, always going down. Nobody ever sees it go up. Nobody's horizon is the opposite. Because if you're on this side of the ball, you got a different horizon than if you're on this side of the ball. Up can't be... <laughs> the water can't always be going down. Man. Somebody's on the other side of the ball. They're at the beach. Their water's going up. Man. <laughs> Everybody horizon can't be the same. <laughs> hey, we almost out of here, man. Again, uh, this a plain truth dot info, you know, also has this flat earth uh, or <laughs> NASA documentation, flat non-rotating earth. We're talking about linearized systems. Here's another government document, this time from the FAA, entitled That Makes a Flat Earth, entitled Something That Makes a Flat Earth Reference. On page 32, it states, so in other words, for all intents and purposes, unless you are traveling at above Mach 3 or intend to travel into low Earth orbit or higher, then you should just consider the Earth to be flat. This is from the FAA. Unless you're traveling above Mach 3 <laughs> or plan on leaving the Earth. <laughs> uh, just consider the Earth to be flat, boss. Build your railroads and your bridges and canals. Hundreds of feet don't even uh, make any allowance for curvature, even though it's supposed to curve every eight or eight inches every mile, right? But just consider it to be flat. Forget about it. But if the Earth was truly curved, when this, this, or the, ah, but if the earth was truly curved, then this would not work. For example, if you were flying from Sydney on the east coast of Australia to Perth in Western Australia, you would have to travel a distance of 2,034 miles. The alleged earth curvature over the distance should be 522.37 miles of curvature. Of 2,000 miles. You should have 500 miles of earth curvature, boss. 500 miles of curvature. But they don't make no allowance for it. That means that unless the pilot, <laughs> remember the airplane pilot, unless the pilot of the airplane, because you flying from Sydney, right? Unless the pilot 
constantly dipped the nose of the plane down toward the ground as he flew. By the time he reached Perth, he would be flying at an altitude of 522.37 miles or 2,758,113 feet higher than he should be. But they coasting at, what, 30,000 feet? But you ain't been dipping your plane down every mile eight inches to make allowance for this 522 miles of curvature or 2,750,000 feet of curvature. You're just going straight, boss, because you're on a flat plane. That fact alone proves the earth is flat. It's not a globe. And he said, you can download the document here. And when I press that, it says, nah, boss, <laughs> not from the FAA, boss. The page or file you requested can't be found, boss. Damn. I mean, if it was bullshit, why would they take the page down, boss? Huh? Yeah, man. Sapphire throne. Sapphire staff. Moshe got that water, got that look, got that revelation, got that security. And this staff has always been in the family, man. <laughs> Adam had the sapphire staff, Noah, Shem, man, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Man, then Moses plucks it out when none of the mighty men in the Kenites could. That's how he won Sapor in Jethro's eyes, in Reuel's eyes. That's how he, uh, you know, established that he is one who has the right to it. To have a right to the staff means, man, you got a right to the throne, the sapphire throne of Hawaii. We'll be back talking this Enoch drop, getting in these cosmologies. And love to Big Judah, you know, he just dropped some drop on Antarctica. And we uh we made sure we put that on our uh our community page, man. So hey hop. Hey hop to the Nuggets, man, checking in on the community page. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Big Judah dropping jewels, man. So, hey, how the bro? We belly flopping. Let's go for the dismount. I would suggest going and checking it out about special forces going into some cave. And, I mean, I'm not going to tell you all about it because you can go check out the video yourself. But it was pretty interesting. But I just found the timing of it pretty, pretty funny. That when Mosai started giving this information, and all of a sudden, you know, Steven Benoon comes out with his video. But I mean, I know he's already done videos years ago on this topic. But you see, now the Mosai is putting, it, you know, these puzzle pieces together. It's like, you know, the vast majority of the world is not going to put, hey, they're not going to figure out that when these nations all come together, they're always coming together against Israel. That's who they're coming against. Bang. Take a look at Psalms 83. For lo, Thine enemies make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people, and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, and let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. So you see all these nations coming together to keep everyone out of this area. <laughs> like a caucus, like the Caucasian. They're hiding something. They're hiding something that belongs to Israel. They're hiding something that belongs to the Most High's chosen people. Could there be aliens there? 
Could be. Could there be fallen angels that have been in prison there? Could be. Could be many things. You know, they talk about how there's secret bases under, you know, under the ice and things like that, and how they're doing these experiments. Could be. But just like the books in the Vatican are hidden, they're also going out of the way to hide, you know, their efforts in this area. <laughs> and we know they're hiding Tara Zong the boss. Go get your map pack, map pack. Holy land, man. Hey, all praise to Wah and the water you drop nation. Hey, the water big Judah, man. I see it popping off and all my knockers in the ether squad. Tune in to 432 to drop radio. Live at 432 to drop.com. Flat drop 101. Hey, it's popping off every Wednesday, man. So get that drop and continue to surf the wave. Hey, we appreciate y'all, man. This has been the third uh installment of the brand new series for my Nagas really on this flat drop called flat drop 101 <laughs> for the fifth wave. Hey, with a dragonfly perspective, you can see clearly and allow Hawa for lifting the Ruach Tarde Ma <laughs> so we can start searching honestly about our investigation, not to prove nobody wrong or prove nobody right, but to prove the truth, to prove a why, to validate the existence of our creator. Wah, la wah, stay up, suit up, choose up.